Yes. Okay, we're going to be moving on to the next um, panel, which is chaired by Professor Lenore Manderson, who is a distinguished professor of public health and medical anthropology in the School of Public Health at the University of the Witwatersrand. Um, Lenore is known internationally for her research and training and mentorship, and she publishes on inequality and the social context of infectious diseases and chronic illness in Australia, Southeast Asia, and Africa. The session is called Building Trust and Confidence in Healthcare. Over to you, Lenore. Thank you very much. Um, it's really lovely to be part of this session. Um, and it's a very timely topic to be talking about trust, including at a time when, in some respects, trust has never been lower, both in terms of the motivations of people um, for particular interventions, in terms of the motivations of the people who provide the care, and in terms of the politics of funding and the ways in which funding and goods and supplies and care are provided. And I'm particularly mindful of that because of the ways in which um, there have been rising concerns um, about that in relation to um, the um, health of the population globally in terms of COVID-19, um, people's reluctance to present for care, people's sense of disrespectful care being provided to them and their suspicions about the information that they're being given. So the people who are going to be presenting um, I'm going to begin with Dr. Ephemor Monye and Grace Kelly Mouvonyi, who are going to talk about an example from Abuja, Nigeria, on how non-communicable diseases management can be transformed through lifestyle medicine and virtual group consultations. And the virtual, of course, is critical to what um, to the present, given that most consultations or increasingly consultations are provided virtually with a real problem around the fact that so many people are excluded from that because of their limited um, access towards communication technology and data. So appropriately following on from Katrina's um, meditation session and the emphasis she placed on joy, um, this next presentation is about curating NCD care as a joyful experience between providers and patients. On that, that she will be speaking today. Paris, thank you so much. And sorry about the bumbling beginning. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. Uh, it's fine. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much um, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone who is here today. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, Somo, let me know if you can see my screen. We can't see it yet. No, if not yet, if you could. Um, actually, the problem may well be that I think whoever has control of the screen needs to give you also control. Yep, that's okay. It's starting. Thank you. Okay. Could you put it into? Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so my name is uh, Peris Musitia. I'm from Kenya. Um, I'm going to take you through finding joy in healthcare and uh, specifically uh, about um, uh, impressing communication skills and emotional competency uh, for neonatal nurses. Uh, this work we are doing with uh, Manambu Mboga as our trainer. Uh, she's a nurse and uh, being assisted by Sassi Molnix. Um, from the, this kind of a photo, uh, you can see we have um, on my right, we have a nurse or a healthcare provider who is very uh, maybe tired or having burnout. And then there's another healthcare provider who they're having an argument or an exchange. But then on my left, you can see children. Uh, this is a neonatal unit, a, a picture representing how a neonatal unit looks like. So these are babies. Um, four of them sharing a cot um, in a, a particular hospital. So what does this 
Sharili, tell us, uh, the healthcare providers undergo very many challenges uh, in their line of duty, uh, duty. These are health system challenges that are beyond their ability to, to handle them. And uh, they need to be human. They are humans, they have feelings. But then again, they are supposed to handle these feelings and the emotions amid these, these are challenging work environments. So they, how they communicate and uh, their behaviors uh, will influence uh, how they are able to control and take uh, care of their emotions. So uh, also on the other hand, when the mothers or the patients get admitted uh, in these hospitals, they, they come with expectations to feel cared for, to feel safe, to be received with respect on compassion and empathy. And uh, these mothers, when they, they come in the unit, most of them, they did not expect to be admitted. They are pregnant and they expected self-delivery and to go back home. But now here they are being uh, taken to the neonatal unit because the child is a preterm or the child, the, the child uh, has a condition. So this mother automatically uh, gets into shock so she already has the emotional trauma of giving birth and now being added other, other emotional uh, stress of being uh, brought in the unit to stay for quite some time. So while in these units, uh, good communication can help the, uh, the healthcare worker, the nurse, be able to build um, professional relationships, lessen these uh, parental stress, uh, the distress for the mothers, and also encourage and um, enhance a parental involvement in the care, only if there is that good communication. Uh, uh, the healthcare providers over time have also an additional task, apart from the clinical care, they also have a role in uh, providing emotional care to these patients. And how, how the emotional care will, will be provided will impact on the kind of um, care given to these babies. If the, the nurse is uh, friendly and is enjoying her work and she's able to engage uh, and respect these mothers, then the mothers are able to produce milk faster. The babies are, are able to get enough breast milk and they're able to add more weight and they're able to go home faster. So it can reduce the hospital stays even if there is that uh, good work environment between the nurse and the patient. Uh, there have been a little focus on emotional care or uh, soft skills. Uh, as a quality of care indicator. Most of the indicators in the clinical system that are more quantitative, focusing on um, instruments, uh, equipment, medicines, and other, uh, other quantitative clinical data yeah. is being used to measure the quality of care. So the aspect of emotional uh, value that nurses offer to these mothers sometimes go undocumented and uh, has not been really embraced uh, to be used as a measure of uh, quality of care. So if effective communication, effective communication helps in sharing information. It can also help in, in uh, strengthening the relationships like what I've just explained. So uh, nurses or managers, uh, the people who are in the, in the management positions uh, need to communicate well to provide coaching and mentorship to their uh, staffs. Multiple studies uh, have linked the uh, improved communication to better patient outcomes and also um, uh, improve, improvement in the uh, reduced number of hospital stays. So when we have, uh, on the other hand, when we have poor communication, the health worker is, uh, gets demotivated and there's lack of within the team. The lack of nurse-patient communication also has been linked to the occurrence of medical errors. When there is limited communication or insufficient or inappropriate communication, where the, the nurse, maybe during the handover, the nurse is not able to explain what has been offered to the patient. So you find another nurse will come and do a wrong thing. Basically, what is being missed is not about the care, rather than it's just about the miscommunication. And this then enhances medical errors that might put a hospital also uh, in, a black, uh, in a black spot or a black name out there. So what needs to be done? So strengthening communication and emotional management among nurses can enhance their confidence, satisfaction with their job. And uh, just as the speaker introduced, uh, it also enhances trust. When people are able to confide in each other and also they're able to respect each other, they're able to, to 
to see each other, to step in their, each other's shoes, to show empathy, and they they develop trust. And trust is the is the main ingredient of teamwork and our job satisfaction. So uh, over the past years, uh, we this intervention, communication skills, and emotional management interventions. Uh, yes, they have been there in African in our African um, uh, in the developing country research. Uh, we find most of the studies are focused on the on, on oncology nurses, maybe because they work with critical ill patients. Yes, because uh, these are patients who need more emotional support in their last stages of life. And then again, there's also a need to focus on the neonatal uh, care and the care and the child visit in the hospital. Why? Because these mothers uh, stay with these children at most minimum of two weeks for the babies to gain weight for them to be discharged. If a child is born 800 grams, the child will stay in the unit to add weight up to 1.2 or 1,200 grams or 1,500 grams for the baby to be discharged. So for, in between that period of between 800, 800 grams and 1,500 grams, this mother is staying in that neonatal unit. Remember the mother is not sick. So this mother is going to interact with a long period of time with these particular nurses as she breastfeeds the baby. So there is need to also empower nurses and also um, the patients to have that uh, favorable interaction in their level of work so that they enjoy what they are doing and the kind of care they're offering these mothers. So that they have that collaboration and easy relationship because this mother is here for the next one week. So if you disagree with the mother on day one, then this mother will, will, uh, will um, hold information from you. Then you as a nurse, you're not able to help this mother to, to know her problem. So, uh, some, or some nurses maybe might say that mother is stubborn or that mother is very hard to deal with. Just because this mother has not seen anybody who has trust in her or him or in her ability to take care of the baby. And some of them even withdraw. And when they withdraw, it's going to work against the nurse again because the nurse is not going to find joy because the nurse is not going to be able to, to get enough milk supply for this baby to add weight. So basically, there's that uh, need for the um, enhancing awareness, uh, our communication skills between the, that they know how to communicate, how to empathize, how to, how to take care of control of their own emotions. So for this particular presentation, I'm going to describe uh, what we have been doing uh, in, uh, in Kenya. Because it's an intervention, it's an interventional research. So I'm going to just explain part of the course design, how our course is designed. Uh, and also uh, the initial influence of this particular course that we are offering on in interpersonal relationships uh, for between the nurses themselves and also between the nurse and the patient. So for the intervention, uh, we, we, we're doing it in 16 uh, county hospitals. These hospitals are part of a, a network, we call it a clinical information network. So basically this, there's already a bigger intervention happening in this particular hospital. Uh, the Clinical Information Network is a collaboration between the Kenya Medical Research Institute, the Ministry of Health, that is the Kenya Ministry of Health, and the Association of the Kenya Pediatric Research Consortium. So they have come together to, uh, to form a consortium that helps in improving the quality of pediatric and neonatal care that is being administered. So this particular consortium or network uh, collects routine clinical data to use the data for improving the quality of care. So this particular intervention for communication skills and emotional awareness is an additional intervention to enhance teamwork and foster patient-centered care in these particular hospitals. So how is this uh, uh, communication skills course organized? How have we organized it? And how do we enable uh, make it to bring joy to the nurses? Uh, first, uh, it's, a, it's a phase, it's a, a phase training. It's not a one-off training, it's not a one-day training. It's a training that takes six, nine months. And uh, in this training, uh, we try to enhance a personal behavior change, elicit it from within the person. So in phase one, we have self-observation. Uh, we give reflective tasks to the participants to reflect how they communicate, how their communication affects people around them, and also how they are, emotions affect their work and if what gives them joy and what really 
uh, makes them maybe create conflict. So it's a personal uh, awareness reflection. Usually they write in their notebooks and then they share with our trainer. So we call it an awareness building phase. We, we give them tasks, they write down, they observe themselves every indi at an individual level. It takes between three to four months of uh, self-observation. Then, uh, then once they send uh, the feedback to us, uh, the trainers, uh, we, have, we read through those uh, experiences and we, we use the experiences to design an intervention. We use these experiences to design the training. So our training is basically focused on their own need, needs that have been uh, raised from their own observations. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the second phase, we have a workshop. This is a five-day workshop. And in this workshop, we, we train, the, we, we bring in the, the, the gaps that have been identified and we customize the training to reflect those particular gaps. Then after that training, we also teach them the theory, the skills that they need to use uh, to cope with these challenges and also to empower themselves to enjoy what they are doing. And that uh, this is just one, one, uh, one, uh, one example of, um, of one of the meetings that we hold with these particular nurses in the hospital. So once uh, after the workshop, we give them again and an other tasks, again, another reflective assignment. We tell them to go again and use the skills that we have taught them. Now we have taught them in the in the first phase they discover they don't have they don't know how to communicate they they are high tempered they have a problems interacting with the patients they don't give them time that's just an example so we, we give them skills on how to be active listeners we empower them with skills on how to step back skills on active listening skills on empathy skills on handling emotions like death in the hospital so that they're able to do it better and enjoy their work. So in, in, this, in this first three, we give them now um, another assignment to go and use those particular skills that we have taught them now to put into practice into their daily routine. So for example, if they have told them about active listening, we give them assignment to write down how they did an act of active listening, how did it make them feel, and how did it make the colleagues or the nurse feel. So it, it um, brings that uh, inner feeling of, if I communicate well, if I listen to the patient, the patient gains trust in me and the patient is happy for me to serve him or her. If I listen to my colleague, my colleagues will want, uh, appreciate me to listen to them. They, they, they feel I respect them. So those are the things that every a person, uh, the nurse goes through that as an individual. And then after that, we bring them back again to another workshop. We call it a follow-up workshop. In this follow-up workshop, we, we help them to follow, we, we try to brainstorm on how they use the skills and the challenges that they experience using these particular skills. Yeah, in, in, I'll let you know later that it's not even easy to practice these particular skills, despite us empowering them with the skills to listen, to show empathy, to step back, handling conflict. Sometimes we, we have those systematic challenges, again, that might be a hindrance for them also to practice these particular skills. Yeah, so for this particular intervention, we started in 2019. Uh, in March, we had a planning meeting. This is a planning meeting happening here. We identified the training needs in the planning meeting. Between March and May, we give them reflective assignments to plan reflect on how they communicate and how they handle their emotions and how they expect to feel. And then um, we had a workshop. And then in June, we had another skills work. Uh, we gave them another skills to go and do. And then we had a follow-up workshop. And then they are given certificates. They have completed the training. So basically, this is a, a, phase, is a nine, six to nine months training. So during the planning meeting, uh, these are some of the challenges that the nurses uh, really uh, shared to be very common that also hindered them to achieve joy in their work. For example, when handling patients, there was issue about uh, we have angry patients, parents who have lost a baby, they are very emotional, and some of the nurses are not aware of how to handle that particular parent, what to tell them, how to comfort them. Because emotional awareness is not taught in the syllabus during the medical training college, which is also a gap that is existing. So nurses are not, well, had uh, challenges with also uh, incorporating patients, patients who come in with a pre-informed mind that uh, I'm not going to breastfeed the baby. 
I'm not going to stay in the unit and the baby needs to get milk. Some, some mothers just refuse to express breast milk. So they needed more skills how to talk to these mothers to enable them to uh, produce milk for their babies. And then also other challenges highlighted in dealing with the patient was about patients who come uh, keep calling for help. So these are uh, was shown like it really reflected some nurses, like they, the mother keeps on calling every time, every time, come and do this, come and do this. So it didn't go well with some nurses. Yeah, on the other hand, also there were challenges also handling colleagues, nurses, between nurses themselves, disrespectful. Some nurses were very disrespectful towards others. And this really hindered their joy in working together. They, when it, there was even reports of a nurse saying, I can't work with someone, so I can't be assigned a duty on with that particular person because they don't have a, 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 a good uh, rapport to work together. And so at the end of the day, that affects the quality of the care we are giving to the baby in that particular unit. We have irresponsible, maybe uncooperative colleagues who will just don't care. They just come and sit in the unit. They don't want to work. They don't follow up or maybe they don't do the right documentation. So it really uh, bridges the gap between the, the colleagues themselves and also issue of being judgmental and non-appreciative. It was fun when we asked uh, nurses, how many times do you appreciate your colleague? And some of them were like, I don't remember. They're like, is it bad or good? It's like, it's just normal. I just take it for granted like it's a responsibility. I don't see it like a nurse coming early. I don't see it being a big thing to tell the nurse you have done well to come early. So yes, they, they were taking things so casual and they found that that was, that was a challenge and they wanted to improve so that they can enjoy working together, being appreciative of each other, responsible and also be respectful. Also, there was a communication challenges when they're dealing with supervisors in terms of uh, there was a security complex. Supervisors who listen but don't sort out problems and there were those know it all or non-committal supervisors who are not really able to commit and uh, solve the nurses' uh, challenges. Yeah, so these are, are some of the tra training needs uh, as you are identified from the planning meeting. And these are some of the training needs that we worked on with the particular cohort of nurses uh, to, to train them on. Five minutes more, please, periods, I'm afraid. Oh, thank you. Okay. So this is an example of a challenge, uh, a reflective task. The mother kept calling for the fixing of NG at night. I felt the mother was becoming a bother. Yeah. So what were the learning needs? What are the things that they wanted to learn? Listening, uh, communicating with the clients, and also being patient with their patients, managing their own emotions, and also the issue of being impatient. Yeah. What are the modules that you have been able to empower them with? You have been able to, to take them through constructive feedback, handling of emotions, basic communication skills, uh, dealing with conflict, and also uh, managing their own emotions. Okay, I'll go faster. So what are some of the changes that we have witnessed huh, from this training that we've been uh, doing? Overall, there's improvement in relationship with patients and colleagues and supervisors. The, these are self-reported results. Huh? Then there's confidence in the work and communication methods. The nurses have shown improvement in how they are communicating to each other and also to their patients. So, and at the end, they are, they are saying they're enjoying their work. There's uh, the skills to stop automatic reactions. They have been able to, to, to learn how to step back from getting angry, from shouting, and rather stepping back and meditating on what, um, how to react. So they're able to take a step back. They're able to now have respect to take care of their own emotions and their patient's emotion. And from this picture, you can see these are during the training, they were listing the skills basket that they have gained from this particular training. Yeah, so these are just example of key changes. First, now they are, the nurses are able to see the patient as a person. They are able to identify with the patient. They are being now more empathetic. And now when they are more empathetic with the patient, what happens is the patient is, becomes cooperative towards them and they enjoy working together with the, the patient. And then there's also ability to handle patients emotions well, especially patients who have lost their loved ones in the hospital. Um, because of this particular training, nurses now are finding it easier to, to condole or to, to offer emotional support to their mothers. This is an example, a mother lost a baby and it was not handled well. She was rushed to sign papers. And the, the baby died. So the relatives reacted badly and the nurse was rude with a don't care attitude towards them. I listened to the mother. This is a nurse now saying she showed empathy and advised her and later she calmed down. 
Okay. So they're also able to understand uh, each other uh, and also treat each other with respect, be able to handle conflicts in their own environment. So because of the ability to step back, being aware, they were more now, um, they were more reflective of their action and this enabled them to work together in harmony and enjoy their work environment. There are also another, another change is that because of this, they are able to regain their professionalism, professionalness, which has been thrown, had been thrown to the wind. And for, because of this training, they are able now to see patients wholesomely, not just to offer clinical care, but to go beyond clinical care and listen to the patient, put themselves in the shoes of the patients. And also they're able to deal with the external stressors of the health system, for example, work overload overload and the few patients that are there are many patients and you have limited time. So with this particular course, you are able to realize when you are getting burnout, you are able to realize when uh, you are getting into conflict because now you are aware of the antennas, the antennas to detect their environment with a bit now are, are very raised and this really help them to regain their ability to be professional nurses, offer their, their work as professions and also enjoy and enhance teamwork. Because when you treat your colleagues with respect, then you are able to work together in harmony and, in, and improve teamwork. And at the end of the day, improve how you're treating your patients and the quality you're offering this particular patient. Some are also seen as role models because now after the training, they changed how they used to communicate and uh, they could uh, be called upon by their colleagues to find help in other departments. So it, it strengthened their relationship, it gave them confidence and also gave them that ability to, to feel they can, they can do it and they can really help their colleagues in their work. And this is what we really look forward to, enjoying and working together as a team, enjoying what you are doing to help the patient because the patient is a really a beneficiary and the key person here in the quality of care. Okay. Yeah, insight, it also builds general good relationships between uh, healthcare workers themselves and uh, people are now able to work as, team, as a team and uh, they're able to respect each other. I'm sorry, I've not been able to read this quote because of the time. So like this one, it says, thanks for bringing me to a larger extent colleagues to this reality. A good appreciated colleague nurse tends to have a good relationship with the patient. She handles, the patient she handles, at the end of the day, Good relationship between colleagues and patients is interminable. It counts on me that showing appreciation helps in building one's esteem, and that has been really my wake up call. Yeah, so this cause is in, uh, really uh, enabling the nurses to have their antennas to appreciate each other, to see each other as um, an individual rather than before being a nurse, to see the patient as an individual, to love what they are doing, to do it in a humane, I say in a humane manner. And, and this gives them an uh, ability to enjoy their work uh, as nurses. So it has not been easy also. Now, please, Paris, wind up, please. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. So as I mentioned earlier, this, this as, as long as you are training the nurses, then we have had challenges in also for them practicing this is the workload. The nurses are few, we, we have issues of understaffing and uh, as, as much as they want to do the right thing, they want to appreciate their work, some of them, they cannot do it because of the workload and the sarcasm from colleagues. After the training, some are being told, you think that you can really talk to every mother here. You know, you, you'll just calm down. So, so those who had not been going to the training were still discouraged those who had been in the training to practice their particular skills. For example, I'm just putting red. The mothers are very stubborn. If you entertain them too much, how much do you think you'll achieve if you want to listen to everyone? Yeah, so this was a, like more of a sarcasm. I, uh, you know, when the nurse was trying to use the skills that are being taught. Yeah, in terms of workload, yes, you can see they're saying you can have 80 babies and 80 mothers. So trying to empathize with each other is very, can make you get burnout. So it's not that they, do, they don't want to practice, but really even the opportunity to practice itself uh, is curtailed by these uh, health system challenges. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Paris, for your comments about um, really reviving and reinforcing for nurses why they were undertaking nursing in the first place and for helping them find ways through the structural barriers that they experience with their supervisors as well as the ones between themselves and um, those women who are their patients, often in very vulnerable ways. 
The next presentation is two speakers together, Grace Kelly Mouvoni, um, whose background is in nutrition, dietetics and um, global health delivery um, from the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. And she is a lifestyle medicine professional and with particular experience in non-communicable diseases, in nutrition literacy and in diabetes. And she does have um, background um, in the Rwanda Diabetes Association, but she's also interested in transforming medical school education. And I, I'm going to hold, hope that we can come back to educating health professionals because that seems to me a core link between the two presentations. The speaker who's going to talk with Grace is Ifeoma Monier, who is the Chief Consultant Family Physician, the National Hospital in Abuja in Nigeria, and is also a lifestyle medicine physician with a background again in lifestyle medicine. Um, she um, is a member of the Advisory Council for the International Virtual Group Consultations and an expert member of Health Nutrition Technical Working Group of the Nigeria Development Plan. The, um, her presentation, again, raises questions about how um, virtual group work might help people achieve contentment and address um, health challenges um, without face-to-face -face interventions and um, will bring to us an understanding of both what lifestyle medicine is and how physicians and other health professionals might work with patients to, towards that. So Grace or Ifeoma, who is going first? Uh, thank Hello, you I just wanted to jump in very quickly. Um, I realized that it might happen that we may be cut off because the link ends in exactly 14 minutes. So if everyone looks in the chat box, I've put the link to the second afternoon and immediately if it cuts off, please have this in your browser ready to jump into the next one. I'll make sure it's set up so that we have minimal disruption. Is to finish that paper if, if that happens and then to have some brief questions before lunch. So, Grace. Okay, okay, thank you for the introduction. I'll go ahead and share my screen and then we can begin. Um, so, um, I'll go ahead and start as we wait for Dr. Monia to join us. Um, today she was traveling, so she's um, a bit delaying, but um, we can go ahead and start. So thank you so much for um, the time. Um, so the pre this uh, presentation, it's called Lifestyle Medicine, Positive Psychology and Virtual Group Consultations for Elderly Married Couples with NCDs uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in Abuja, Nigeria. And it is a case study at the Brookfield Center for Lifestyle Medicine. Um, so I'll be joined here with um, my um, partner here, Dr. E Dr. Monier, um, who we've heard from her introduction. And we can go ahead and start, and I hope that she'll be able to join shortly. So, um, so as we go in, I first wanted to lay the backdrop of what's happening here in um, what in the global south, we can say. Um, maybe you've heard of the term invisible epidemic and maybe not, um, but what is referred here as the invisible epidemic is non-communicable diseases. And the reason why it's an epidemic is because the rise of NCDs in um, you know, low middle income countries is um, rapid and it disproportionately affects low middle income countries. So today we're looking specifically at Nigeria, looking specifically at Abuja. Um, and when we look at uh, NCDs in Abuja, Nigeria, we see that 29% of deaths are from NCDs. There's a 22% probability of premature deaths from NCDs, um, specifically in Nigeria. And when, when I'm talking about NCDs, maybe you're like, what do you mean? <laughs> so the World Health Organization looks at these top four NCDs as the leading causes of mortality, heart disease and stroke, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, and diabetes. And with those four leading causes of death, there are also four key modifiable behavior risk factors, which is physical inactivity, um, tobacco use, unhealthy diet, and excessive intake of alcohol. So 
we have already this backdrop of NCDs. Um, so, but now on top of that, we also have the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, you know, infectious diseases is nothing new, but this pandemic is, is very new and it has introduced many complex problems um, to um, Sub-Saharan Africa. I particularly wanted to highlight here in red that since the COVID-19 pandemic, people living with NCDs are more vulnerable to becoming severely ill or dying from COVID-19, which it's not you know, so surprising as we live through this pandemic, it's almost two years. Um, so with this, we see, an, we see a double burden of disease. Um, and this graph here illustrates um, exactly what I mean here is, how the COVID pandemic and the NCD epidemic have brought about a deadly interplay. Uh, I wanted to highlight on this graph here of um, today where we're at. So we've had a whole year in 2020 of disruption of services, disruption of NCD services um, because of the different um, effects of the pandemic. Um, and this was done from a WHO um, survey in May 2020 that showed that um, looking at uh, 155 different countries that there was a disruption of NCD services during a time in history where NCD patients are more vulnerable. Um, and then of course, like I mentioned before, since the outbreak, people with NCDs are more vulnerable. Um, and like I mentioned before, why are what are the main causes of NCD service is being disrupted. Well, nothing foreign to us. There's low PPE, there's limited staff um, available. There's um, you know, low population, or there's been a decrease or even a halt of population level screening programs, maybe no public transportation. All of these issues are kind of um, leading to create um, this, like what this conference has called um, very wicked problems um, in our healthcare system. So with all this backdrop, you know, there's a vulnerable population that um, is highly impacted and that's the elderly. So particularly in Nigeria, Nigeria is the 19th largest elderly population in the world. And we know that with aging, aging is associated with functional decline, NCDs, weak compromise immunity and um, reduced adequate sleep, an increased need for social support. So aging or the elderly population, they have all of these um, different needs, but during this time, there's also a lot of different fears. There's also a lot of different things going on. Um, as we see here, um, you know, there's a high NCD prevalence. There's the fear of, of contracting COVID-19, um, social isol isolation, unhealthy sleep duration, perceived depression, all these um, different factors um, that are really stressing and impacting the elderly population. So I think what I've done so far is really set up the backdrop of um, um, many different problems and how, they're, uh, how they are affecting elderly population in Nigeria. So with that, as I've listed out all the different problems, um, I wanted to present a case study of uh, a solution that's happening here in Africa and Abuja, Nigeria. So I did want to pause here just for a moment to see if Dr. Monier is on the call. I don't see her name. Okay. Um, so, so please do excuse me. I am, uh, will present on her behalf. Um, and uh, if she does join, uh, we'll move accordingly. So the Brookfield Center for Lifestyle Medicine was established in 2014. It's the first lifestyle medicine center in Africa. And what it is, is it's, it's a center staffed with um, medical personnel who are trained in lifestyle medicine. Um, and they offer both lifestyle medicine treatment and also um, family care and, and normal treatment that you would receive at like a clinic. So what Brookfield Center for Lifestyle Med Medicine um, wanted to do with like all these augmenting problems affecting the elderly population um, is they, com uh, they combined uh, lifestyle medicine principles, virtual group consultations, and the Nigerian culture to create a very unique but also very relevant um, treatment. So for NCD patients. So that's what this is about. That's what we're going to talk about today. So before um, I go into the intervention and the case study, I wanted to give a, um, a description and explanation on what these three components mean. So first starting with um, lifestyle medicine. So lifestyle medicine is a relatively new concept. Um, 
Um, but it is rapidly growing, not just in America or what we would say the Western world, but across the, the globe. Um, and I can define lifestyle medicine to be, you know, according to the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, lifestyle medicine is the use of evidence-based lifestyle therapeutic interventions, including a whole food, plant, um, predominant eating pattern, regular physical activity, restorative sleep, stress management, avoidance of risky substances, and positive so so social connection as a primary modality delivered by clinicians trained and certified in this specialty to prevent, treat, and often reverse chronic diseases. So in summary here, I like this picture because it, it, it uh, summarizes what this lengthy definition is. Um, and the reason why lifestyle medicine is very relevant to NCDs is because it directly touches on um, or the connection between NCDs and lifestyle medicine is our immune system and inflammation. Um, so with NCDs, they all go down to um, inflammation. And a lot of lifestyle-related factors and lifestyle-related diseases um, are related to inflammation. And there's um, evidence that supports that these different uh, therapeutic in interventions help reduce inflammation, therefore helping us to better manage NCDs or even prevent them. <laughs> if we can dare say. Um, so like I just said before, what improves immunity is these different lifestyle medicine factors. We have this um, list of chronic diseases um, that I think we're, we're familiar with. And again, like I mentioned before, the common denominator between all these different chronic diseases is inflammation, which is sy systemic inflammation gives rise to endothelial dysfunction, leading to clogged arteries and- I'm to sorry to disrupt, but your film is on the line now. Oh, okay. Awesome. That's great. Um, so I think, oh, okay. Welcome, Dr. Monnier. Thank so, you very much. Okay, to catch, well, actually, this is your slide, so I think you can jump right in. So um, right now we are talking about um, the lifestyle medicine and NCD connection. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Okay, I'm going to give you 10 minutes, but I'm afraid no more than that. And if we get kicked off, and that includes also for you, Dr. Monnier, then we have to flick on to another um, uh, uh, link, which is in the chat. But go ahead, oh. sorry. Oh, is it? Do you think it'd be easier if we all just hopped on that other link now? Is it like we can just go? Well, I think that we've been told this is a Zoom issue, so it's me causing problems. So it, it may not happen on. Um, sorry, it's a Teams issue, so it may not happen with us that we can keep going. Um, but I'll, I'll just put it in the link just in case. It should be fine. All right, then we'll keep on going. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Monnier. Please take over. All right, um, Dr. Monia, can you can you see my screen? Yes, I can. And okay. are we are we hopping on to the next the other link now, or should we just carry no, on? We're carrying on. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. So um, I had a bit of connection issues at the beginning. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm joining at this time. Thank you for your patience. Uh, my name is Dr. Ifoma Monia, and I'm just going to continue from where uh, Grace Kelly. Uh, stopped. Uh, so she was trying to make us understand uh, the connection between lifestyle medicine and non-communicable diseases. And somebody in the chat had just said she's never heard the, the term lifestyle medicine. And yes, that's because this is one of the newest uh, but fastest growing specialty in medicine. And, and please hang on with us and you'll hear a little bit more about that. And so the, the common denominator for chronic illnesses is chronic inflammation. Um, and what we have found uh, with scientific research and evidence is that um, a lot Lot of things that we do every day, our daily habits, it can actually uh, fuel inflammation. And over years, uh, the, re the result we find are all the chronic diseases as, as we have here. Um, but we also know that eating properly, healthfully, and you see on the left side where we have talked about uh, the kind of food and activities that can actually reduce inflammation. And that's why lifestyle medicine is so key now uh, to actually address the root cause of chronic diseases and get rid of them uh, rather than just treating uh, the symptoms. Next slide, please. So at the Brookfield Center for Lifestyle Medicine, headquartered in Abuja, Nigeria, we have an acronym after our name uh, that combines all these pillars of lifestyle medicine. And so the bottom line is behavior change in, in, in managing stress, in, in positive psychology, in risky substances, uh, in sleep, 
spirituality, uh, physical activity, the environment, um, social connectedness and nutrition. Next slide, please. And so uh, one of the new concepts also that indeed has been occasioned by the pandemic is virtual group consultations. Before now, traditionally, we will have patients come one-on-one -on -one, uh, to our clinics uh, and, and then we'll see them face-to-face um, -face or in person. Uh, but with the pandemic, uh, this became very difficult. First of all, patients were scared, literally, to go into health facilities because they thought they would uh, catch uh, uh, COVID when they get there. And, and so from March 2020, when lockdown started in Nigeria, we had to think outside the box on how to reach our patients uh, in, a, in, a, in an acceptable manner where they will be you know, catered for and their health needs continually uh, met. Uh, and that's when we introduce virtual group consultations. What are virtual group consultations? They are consultations that are delivered virtually with groups of patients instead of one-on-one, -on -one, uh, one to one rather, on a virtual platform. So it can be Zoom, it can be uh, uh, Microsoft Teams and so on. Um, studies have shown uh, that virtual group consultations improve access to services. It avoids healthcare provider burnout and provides great opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer support and learning. Uh, and patients always want more time uh, to discuss things that have been really important to them but haven't had an opportunity uh, in the traditional one-to-one, -one, 10 minute uh, consultations. Next slide, please. So what do we actually do very, very briefly uh, at the virtual group consultations? Uh, patients are consulted one by one in the group. Um, patients are given a little bit of health education, not more than five minutes uh, or 10 minutes at the most, and then given an opportunity to uh, respond and react and ask questions. Patients are encouraged to bring all the questions they have concerning their condition. Uh, then the clinician, uh, by the way, the, the virtual group consultation is usually run by a clinician and uh, a facilitator in the minimum, or clinicians and a facilitator. Uh, and so the clinician reviews the, 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 the vital signs, reviews the lab results that have been, that would have been done before the group meets, uh, and then with the patients, uh, creates individual care plans uh, for each person. Next. Uh, and then what happens therefore uh, is that uh, in this COVID season, we have found uh, by our experience at the Brookfield Center for Lifestyle Medicine, uh, that it's provided a lot of social support and connectivity for people who otherwise be in their homes locked away because of COVID. It's provi provided an avenue for high quality continued care. Um, and of course, reduce their uh, exposure to COVID because they don't have to leave their home to come into any center to access care. And it has improved the confidence that patients have over managing their conditions. Next slide, please. So what we have done uh, with this um, uh, new concept uh, is that we have combined uh, the Nigerian culture, which uh, basically on this three, uh, the tripod of these three uh, concepts, the marriage or partnership uh, uh, concept, uh, where there are household norms, for example, in Africa, I believe the rest of Africa also shares this, where the man is the head of the home. So we thought that re really getting just random people, it works, but we wanted to explore uh, whether getting couples into these groups will make a difference uh, because we thought if we address just one person and the person goes back home to, to sort of begin changes, uh, for example, in the food, uh, in physical activity and so on, they may meet some resistance from the other partner who has not been a part of the discussion. So bringing them in where the man will understand why they should eat this way or that, why they should have physical activity, why they should not watch television after uh, such a time because of the blue light that come from the television screen and, uh, and disruption to sleep. Um, we got them all in and got them into the groups and this really helped. Uh, the other thing is that in prayer is very important in the Nigerian culture. So we started and ended every meeting with prayer. Uh, and then there's a strong community sense in Nigeria and that was really evident with the group. Next slide, please. So uh, before I hand over to Grace Kelly, uh, just to mention very briefly that the case study uh, outlines the patients and healthcare provider experience on physical and emotional health when the principles of life, number one, lifestyle medicine, number two, virtual group consultations, and then uh, the Nigerian culture are incorporated uh, and adapted into healthcare delivery for elderly patients with NCDs uh, during the pandemic. And we attempted to create a virtual space where patients can benefit from peer-to-peer -peer learning and support 
uh, for health and behavior change. I'm not going to ask uh, Grace Kelly to please uh, give us a little bit of information uh, about the case study itself. Um, so with this case study, we had... Um, Grace, you have about two minutes of speed talking. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. So I'll... So... I think maybe we can just hop onto that call then because there are a few slides after this one. Is that okay? Absolutely. Or, or, or we just play it out and see what happens. No, I'm gonna cut you off if you play it out and see what happens. I'd skip the demographics and move on to the substance. Okay, sure. So um, yeah, we've mentioned already that they were elderly, that they are married, and that the disease spread. All of these patients had one or more NCDs. Um, uh, the intervention that we, we had was using the VGCs. We met once every week for 90 minutes over 12 weeks. Um, and at the end of the first uh, tranche of 12 weeks, the patients as a group uh, decided to meet every six months as follow-up. And the lifestyle medicine interventions were in the areas of physical activity, uh, nutrition, sleep, uh, stress management, and positive psychology. And these were the prescriptions that were given, examples of them. I'm not going to go through all. So we, we, we dealt with exercise prescription with the fit principle, the frequency, the intensity, the type of exercise, and the duration of the exercise. Uh, the, the, and the nutrition, the type of food, the amount of food, and the frequency of food. And then, of course, sleep prescription also emphasized on sleep hygiene, sleep environment, light exposure, and the dietary uh, approach uh, to better sleep and minimizing stress. Well, uh, we're not going to have a lot of time now because I imagine that we're going to be cut off in a minute. Uh, but the next few slides just talk about positive psychology, uh, defining it. Um, and, and, and next slide, please. And um, talking about some practical techniques of it, counting blessings, savoring the pleasant things in life, uh, regularly practicing kindness and generosity. And these are some of the prescriptions that we, we gave our patients on that meditation, journaling, showing gratitude uh, and, and so on. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to quickly highlight that positive emotions are very protective and they also promote adoption of healthy habits. Next slide, please. So um, I think the, what we wanted to highlight is what was the impact on the patient. So this was a case study and we did surveys. And here are some of the quotes that was um, delivered. Like, um, I received the support to adopt healthy new habits and break new ones. I had confidence, was engraved in us to take control of proper healthy lifestyle and manage. Um, we also asked them about how, how um, you know, what was the difference with them incorporating some of these lifestyle related behavior changes. 90% reported that their physical activity habits had improved. Um, all of them reported that their dietary habits had also improved as evidenced by different things like improved sugar control, um, their sleep habits had improved. And we also, this one's a nice one here that all of them reported that they experienced more joy and happiness about their health um, compared to prior um, joining the VGC group. Um, same with stress management, also social connectedness, all of them reflected back that um, being a part of this group setting helped them um, provide meaningful social interactions. Um, as evidenced by these quotes here, I received encouragement from the group, the group let me know I was not alone. Um, I will just go through this slide very quickly. This was some of the feedback that we got on the VGC um, modality using the VGC, but I will highlight here that um, 90 percent stated that they were very comfortable sharing health information with the virtual group setting, which was one of the things that we thought we would struggle with, but many of them were um, found it comfortable to, to share their health information and what they were going through with their con uh, different conditions. Lastly, you know, this was an intervention that they did with their spouse. Here are some of the things that people said. It was uncommon and it's not tr traditional, but it was fun. Um, it was encouraging and fulfilling. So I'll hand it back over for the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Grace Kelly. This is really a whistle uh, stop, stop that we're doing. You're doing great, thank you. So uh, just to, to wind up and, and close this discussion, we want to highlight in closing uh, that we have found the, a significant role of lifestyle medicine interventions in managing chronic illnesses. Uh, we have also found that there is a great need for everyone to understand and embrace the virtual group consultation and group consultations in person uh, for continuation of care and coordination of care so that patients don't suffer, particularly the vulnerable uh, group. Um, uh, but there is need for training for physicians and healthcare workers uh, 
and facilitators who would do this. Uh, we, we also found that leveraging on partnerships, uh, in this case, marriage, a support system for behavior change really helped and it worked. We will, rec we will leave you with these recommendations. Number one is that we really need more research on the African continent uh, in these areas. Um, VGC uh, in area of um, uh, group consultations in the area, particularly of this new uh, but fast growing specialty of lifestyle medicine. We need uh, a lot of research in this and we need to also develop virtual platforms uh, to implement uh, VGCs. And I will just ask Grace Kelly to uh, close us in uh, quite very quickly, uh, talking about uh, if no matter the amount of lifestyle medicine intervention that we believe in and we want people to practice, there is need for equity uh, uh, in, the, in the community to enable this happen. Take it away, Grace Kelly. All right, quickly, Grace. Sure, sure. This is the closing point. So we just wanted to end this presentation. We've, uh, we've introduced maybe new concepts such as lifestyle medicine, or virtual group consultations, and um, we hope to find uh, to produce more evidence in the African continent of how this can make an impact. But we can't end this without talking about equity, because as NCDs are rising and as there's more of a global priority towards NCD care and management, there also needs to be an equity approach so that certain populations are not left behind. Um, um, so here we, uh, we invite um, and, and, and um, um, say even to be responsible with moving with this new approach is that there's a strong need for government collaborations and different collaborations so that no population is left behind from new interventions like lifestyle medicine being brought and fully incorporated, not really brought, but incorporated into um, different um, nations here in Africa. So that is, uh, I think that's where we can end. Yep. Um, just to quickly add that if anyone wants to know how uh, to become a lifestyle medicine professional or physician, uh, here are some of the societies in the world. In Africa, we've got the Society of Lifestyle Medicine of Nigeria. If you know, we will, no, 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 please. We'll distribute this. Thank you. But I really want to give people a couple of minutes to ask some questions. But so thank you so much for that. That's wonderful. And I'm sure we will share um, some of these slides, including the networks. What I think has been really wonderful that both of you spoke about and also you, Perez, is the way in which your interventions are unsettling um, um, normative relationships and that includes relations of power and um and of gender and the gender the sort of shifts in gendered relations really stood out um in this last example the ones of power and of the way in which hierarchies of responsibility um create difficulties within health services stood out Paris in yours and Paris can you turn your video on too and we'll try um and have a bit more of a discussion I think one of the challenges is that once you do some case studies the real question is how do you scale this up and how do you embed it in a health system um and I want to firstly come back to Paris, who I think is still there, and ask her um, how the changes in nurse communication and practices in neonatal nursing can be embedded so that we don't have the case of a one-off um, intervention and then have to return to that a few years on. And then I'll come back to you two about um, your program too. Paris, are you there? Yes, please just come again. Ah, how do you, what are the challenges in embedding your approach into, into the system? That is, is it, is it a now an issue to be for translation into the nursing curricula? Um, because, I mean, the problem is that whenever we have these kinds of interventions, they're shown to make, have impact, and then two years on, the ideas have sort of diluted and then the next generation of nurses come on and they're still reinforcing old hierarchies and old attitudes towards patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your comments and uh, for listening in. And uh, yes, I totally agree. Um, what you are doing is a pilot intervention. Uh, we are 
we train the first group and uh, what we are planning to do is to get a trainer of trainees. So this particular cohort of nurses uh, whom we trained, uh, we, have, uh, we are doing a TOT training for them to be trainer of trainees, uh, to train the other colleagues in the hospital in other departments and other cadres, the doctors, the clinicians. So that we are empowering them with the knowledge also to be trainers uh, because we can't reach all the hospitals and we can't reach all healthcare workers because of their schedules and the kind of uh, workload that they have. It's, it's a challenge even organizing for those training in those particular hospitals, very true, because of the systematic challenges. So however much we want to reach to everyone, again, it becomes a problem. So in regard to that, we, are, we, are, we have uh, re we strategized our intervention and we are doing uh, another, another study on uh, human resource for health. And uh, we are talking to nurses who are in, in the college and to identify their training needs uh, at the college level to, uh, to see how we can inculcate uh, communication skills and emotional awareness to be part of the curriculum. Because the, the way you are saying, we realize that training nurses who are already employed at the, at the hospital just like hitting from the top. So we're not hitting from down because these are nurses who are, who are going to retire, some of them. They have been there for 10 years, for uh, six years, 20 years. So we have realized and we have re-strategized. We are doing another study on human resource for health. We are talking to nursing students in the first year. We have a cohort and we want to see uh, if, if we're going to work with them from the first year to the third year because at the medical college, there are three years for the diploma and uh, the four years for the bachelor's. So we are going to inculcate this into the curriculum. And again, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy because uh, the nature of our course is not more of a, a one-off. Yeah. It's a more yeah. of a exciting behavior change from within, you know, doing Indeed. reflections Indeed. on the job. Yeah. Okay, so Paris, can I ask, thank you. Can I ask Grace and F. Elma to come in on that also then? And it is around, you know, questions of changing um those who are training and questions around the health system itself just um, again I'm, I'm, oh, well, well, Lenore, can you can you ask that again i'm not sure i quite understand oh, well paris oh, raised yeah. questions around introducing her approach into the nursing curriculum and your intervention um is in order to be sustainable involves some serious changes in the curricula for medical educators, for nutrition support people and so on. And the question is, how do you scale it up? Or what is the next step? Or what are the challenges of scaling up? Oh, great. That's a very good question. Thank you so much. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, Brookfield Center for Lifestyle Medicine uh, uh, has been involved in creating curriculum for lifestyle medicine. Um, and one of one in different organizations and universities, one of the uh, Africa faces a challenge of funds. Um, and so I know if you, if, you, if you explore, there are lots of courses available, but they, many of them are very expensive uh, from Harvard to, to, to Australia and so on. Uh, but there is a particular one that Brookfield uh, has been involved in, in creating the curriculum and actually continues to review. And I, I, I'm a consultant and a member of faculty with the nextgenu.org. Um, uh, I'm just going to type it uh, in the chat so everybody can uh, access that. And what you can do is uh, you can choose uh, Brookfield as your mentor, um, and then we will take you through the course. Um, we, we suggest that you have about nine months uh, to learn that and that you have um, your entire faculty uh, or your entire members of staff be part of, of, of that training. Uh, because like you said, there is a lot of training that is required. I remember many years ago, uh, maybe 20 years ago when I started lifestyle medicine, the, the problem was that nobody knew anything about it. Uh, and I was very keen on telling the population until one of my colleagues from Israel said, listen, Ify, I think we need to talk to the clinicians who are supposed to do this. And so we shifted gear and began to create curriculum for clinicians. So there is um, one readily available at the nextgenu.org. Um, and if you go to the website, nextgenu, sorry, I didn't write it right, nextgenu. You will see that 
it's available, it's free, and you can register to start. And I think that, you know, when you come in groups, um, that will help. So I hope that that sort of begins to uh, help you to know that there are already things available now for this intervention uh, to begin uh, and to, and there is a lot of training available for clinicians. Okay, um, Grace, do you want to add to that? Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think I have anything else to add. I would just say that I think it's about also aligning um, priorities. You know, NCDs. There's a lot of different organizations. There's a lot of different, you know, global campaigns work on NCDs. So now it's just a matter of, you know, aligning and creating those partnerships to make, you know, sustainable and long-lasting. Mm. 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 Um, this is, I think at this stage, I think you've opened up the three of you enormous number of questions around changing relationships between patients and providers and what a patient is um, and around um, how people might communicate and um, unpicking some of the power relations embedded in that and interventions such as those both of you have described help do that. I'm really mindful that we're now 20 minutes over time and although you may all wish to just grab a cup of tea and come back to the screen, I think a little break from Zoom land would be a good idea. So I think Chisoma, it is lunchtime now and people have got enough time for a break. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, so we should have about 45 minutes for lunch. I encourage everybody to copy the next link. If you do want to join, I will be DJing through lunch if you want to have some music through your lunch break for the next 45 minutes. So feel free to do that. But this time is absolutely yours. So if you want to disconnect, please do. But if you want to hang around and listen to music, you're free to do that. And we'll begin the program at about 1.05. Thank you so much. I, I, I imagine my session is over, is it? Yes. Yes, yes. Sorry. That's that that is it. It's um we we had um less than an hour and we've bolted through it with the three of you speaking. And thank you so very much to the three of you. And um we now hand over to D G DJ Chisoma <laughs> definitely. <laughs>